inviting me here. As a matter of fact, I had uh, the opportunity quite often to meet here uh, outstanding Chinese and international intellectuals. I have benefited a lot of it. Uh, as you know, we face difficult times with overlapping challenges. And since uh, a number of experts is here could uh, address more challenges like uh, the pandemic, uh, trade relations, uh, the hiccups in the supply chains, I will concentrate on just one point um, because I'm a think tanker representing a political foundation. So um, when I had talks with colleagues and representing the foundation in other parts of the world, well, I soon realized that what seemed logic in Europe caused a kind of bewilderment and uh, surprise in many other parts, in many other regions of the world. How come that European populations and policy uh, representatives represent, reacted so strongly on the Ukrainian crisis, on Russian move in Ukraine? And um, well, first of all, there are two simple reasons. Uh, the conflict is geographically closed, um, and that drives uh, migration into all parts of Europe. And second, one part involved is a nuclear power, which is a different dimension. But the third point is even more important to my understanding. And that for that, we have to do a short glimpse in history. Um, Europe, different from China, has never been a space with one central empire. It was always um, a space where medium-sized powers, four to five, had a kind of permanent competition, formed coalitions for limited time. These coalitions changed. And we experienced uh, military conflict in Europe for 500 years. And that culminated in the horrible wars of the 20th century and only the Second World War, ending at the middle of the century, 20th century, uh, brought casualties of about 25 million people. And um, then a new situation arose, and a situation with the first European superpower, the Soviet Union, and a divided continent, the Cold War. But the Cold War, lasting for almost 40 years, at even two very different periods. I would distinguish the 50s and 60s. And that was really confrontation, big armies standing on both sides and a complete lack of confidence and the feeling that the Third World War was extremely close. It got up every, for every moment. And then a second period that started about 50 years ago, ago from now in the early 70s, when suddenly both sides found it beneficial to negotiate. Mostly centered in the negotiations in Helsinki around the, what was later called the Conference on Security and Cooperation. And that was finished with a uh, accord of Helsinki in 1975. And that is a long list of um, points that were agreed upon. I just uh, quote a few refraining from the use of force, inviolability of frontiers, territorial integrity of states, peaceful settlement of disputes. That was signed for the Soviet Union by Secretary General Gorbachev, no, hmm. a strong man. And that accord was what in China is often called a win-win situation. The main gain for the Eastern Bloc was that disputed borders that had been drawn at the Yalta Agreement, 45, were formally recognized by many Western European countries, although they had not been invited to negotiate, to give their opinion, but even though they accepted these borders. And the main gain for the West was um, the understanding that all powers, including superpowers and big powers, would in the future abide to principles cited before. So we had the feeling that a new order had risen. 
where all countries would act bound by rules, like as in a sports competition where all teams play, but they respect the rules for everybody. So that was kind of destroyed beginning on the 24th of February this year. So the general feeling in most European countries is um, we, are not, we are going back in time. We are not going back to 1990, uh, the end of history of Fukuyama. That's not the point. We are not even going back to the 70s. The 70s were still Cold War and big armies confronting each other. No, we are going back to the 50s. We are going back to the times of distrust, mutual. Yeah. And we are going back to times that where you cannot calculate your actions anymore because you do not have the feeling what will the other side do. And that is something that is uh, that has changed the minds in Western Europe so much that what Mr. Hildebrand called the cycle vendor or a tidal firm, or top firm um, and that has even changed um, the positions of countries like Sweden or Finland that had maintained neutrality for a long time. And I would say Western and Central European countries are not, and that's maybe different, aiming at conquering territory or moving borders. What they want, what they seek is assurance that the set of rules uh, agreed upon during the Helsinki process can be credibly restored. We want to live in a world um, guided by rules, not by brute power. So I feel that that conflict will carry on for a while. Uh, NATO General Secretary Stoltenberg said it might take years, not to say. But it will end at a moment of time where no side sees the chance of, uh, say, gaining anything by military action. And then we'll have to negotiate again. And the rebuilding, the building up of new confidence against after again after that, that will be will take time and enormous diplomatic efforts. The earlier that process can start, the better. And maybe the last sense we in Europe hope that China will be a partner in rebuilding a rule base again. And that would be what we expect and wish from China. Thank you very much.